Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Uh, dear all SESME members and participants, Assalamu Alaikum. Very warm welcome to this webinar arranged by Saudi Society for Medical Education, Riyadh Office Journal Club. I'm Dr. Shazia Iqbal, chairperson and organizer for continued professional development activities at Saudi Society of Medical Education, SESME. Being medical educators, we need to train future physicians on essential clinical skills with high decision-making accuracy. As we are keen to train physicians to improve patient care and risk reduction, we need to ensure the implementation of educational activities which can sharpen the learner's ability for history-taking skills, physical examination, diagnostic skills, treatment, and follow-up plans. For that matter, Simulation-based medical education can enhance decision-making abilities and competencies in virtual clinical learning environment, which, is, which mimics just like real-world experience. This educational approach utilizes simulation aids to replicate clinical scenarios and different simulation tools serve as an alternate to real patients. This is a great learning opportunity for trainees because they can make mistakes and learn from these mistakes and that they can come out of the fear of harming the patient. So the topic for today presentation is simulation in medical education. And I'm very much honored and delighted to present our distinguished speaker, Professor Kareem Kayumi. Very warm welcome to Dr. Kayum to Sesame Riyad office. Dr. Kareem Kayumi, uh, uh, Dr. Kareem Kayumi is MD. PhD, FRCSC. He is professor of surgery at University of British Columbia and founder of UBC Center of Excellence for uh, Simulation Education and Innovation. He is also chair of Technology Enhanced Learning for Vancouver, uh, Coastal Health and Regional Director of Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. Dr. Kayumi has uh, authored over 110 peer reviewed publications and is popular guest speaker at international conferences and meeting with extensive international teaching and medical experience. He is founder and CEO of uh, Cyber Patient and Can Health International, which is a registered Canadian nonprofit charity that aims to equalize health education between developed and developing countries. So very warm welcome to Professor Kareem Kayumi. And, uh, uh, we I uh, now uh, stage is yours, so up to you. You can share your slides and start. Okay. Um. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you uh, very much. Um, uh, Shazia Iqbal for, for um, this um, very e extended introduction <laughs> for me. Um, uh, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, say salam alaikum to uh, everyone in Saudi Arabia and around the world. Uh, I don't know whether you are, it's morning here, but somewhere it might be evening, so I can't say good morning or good evening because the times are so there. Yeah. <laughs> so there's good afternoon there. So in, uh, Dr. Iqbal is telling me that um, we may have also people from other parts of the world that may have a different time zone. But in any case, um, uh, it's my pleasure and my honor um, to be here. Um, uh, to be invited by the uh, uh, Saudi Society for Medical Education. Um, I, I thank every one of you for coming and listening to an old man like me. And um, I, I cordially thank, of course, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Sahel uh, El Moradi and, and uh, also uh, Professor Shazia Iqbal for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk to you today about simulation. I have to uh, tell you that for Saudi public, uh, 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 particularly educators, I may not be able to uh, say anything that they don't know because uh, um, I know my colleagues in Saudi Arabia, 
there are much way um, ahead of me in this um, uh, subject, and and um, there there are very intelligent in um, uh, in, in very informed population. Um, however, uh, we can I, I can use this opportunity to have just a chat, uh, uh, a conversation, um, to exchange ideas uh, with all of you. Uh, in this process, we learn from each other. So today I've been asked to talk about simulation and medical education in general. And um, I uh, would like to uh, maybe touch base on uh, simulation history, uh, maybe teaching methods in medical education. How do we make clinical decision? It has been always a problem. And, and how to develop an effective simulation program and maybe I can give you some advices there, may not. <laughs> but also to talk in the end about cyber patient as a tool for medical education. To um, talk about the um, history of uh, simulation, uh, perhaps the modern simulation started uh, uh, when the uh, aviation industry introduce simulation into their education. As you see um, in this slide, before 1950, about 40% of uh, airplane that was going up was, was falling down. So um, in, in after uh, 1962, uh, as you can see, um, it changed. And today, perhaps um, very little, uh, 0 0.001 or 0 0.02, percent of uh, airplane that goes up falls down. The reason for that might be money. Uh, we have better airports, uh, we have better planes, we have better engines, we have better communication systems. We have lots of uh, technology developed in aviation industry. However, nobody can say that simulation and in pilot education did not make a difference in this um, crashing history. So um, after succession of the aviation industry, all other industries started to do simulation, including medicine. In medicine. Um, like, oh, sorry. Um, uh, today, uh, judiciary system, law, police enforcement, uh, even army cannot go to war without simulation. Everybody does first uh, uh, and emulate the environment in, in apply their knowledge and skills in that environment before they go into the real environment. Like for example, the police force. In the past, uh, police were trained to shoot in a, in a shooting uh, ground. So they go and do the target shooting if they hit 10 times uh, the, the heart of the target, then they get a license. Nowadays, that's not enough. Why? Because um, a thief or, or a criminal on the street is a moving target. It's not stationary like a piece of paper. And also it has a gun. <laughs> so it will shoot back at you. And also on the streets, you have lots of uh, children, maybe people going, uh, noises, um, uh, structural things and so on. So the real environment for, for training of, of the police nowadays is that when they finish, um, uh, you know, shooting in uh, tar target practicing, they come to the real environment and they, they actually apply their skills in a simulated environment. And medical education, um, perhaps in the 80, late 80s and, and we started in the early 90s um, talking about simulation. And I remember when I was talking in the early 90s about simulation, uh, people laughed at me. They thought, well, we don't have time to play with dolls. My, my, my director of uh, surgical education actually told me that he doesn't have time to play with dolls. So people did not understand the, the value of simulation. But by year 2000, uh, we uh, started it to build simulation centers. And also the uh, progressive organizations in North America, such as the American College of Surgeons and the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, they formed task force, separate task force 
And, and I was fortunate to be in both of those task force to build accreditation criteria for um, simulation. So that uh, changed the, the, the perception of educators in North America into uh, simulation. And, and nowadays we have simulation uh, centers all over the world, perhaps the most sophisticated ones are in Saudi Arabia. Now, um, but the idea of simulation is not new. It's the technology, it's the use of technology in simulation is new, but the idea of simulation is not new. Um, once upon a time <laughs> in the past, I was asked by American College of Surgeons to uh, provide a lecture on um, surgical techniques and a history, the history of surgical techniques. Uh, and, and they asked me to also write a paper on the history of surgical techniques. So I had to go to the library and find out the, about the history of surgical techniques. And I was very fortunate to um, have a book uh, of an Indian physician surgeon. His name is Shashruta, and he was from the city of Banaras. And that was, that's why they're calling him Shashruta of Banaras, is uh, who lived 600 years before Christian. And the instruments that he, that, he that he described and had at that time in this book, uh, in the surgical techniques that he described is out of this world we still use those surgical techniques and, and the surgical instruments are modified by this very well, well described. Uh, sorry, but with... so, sorry, sorry, Prof, to cut you down. Uh, can you please, on your screen, there are pencils. If you can please uh, close this area on your screen. Oh, this, this one here? Uh, uh, down, down on the right side. Yes, pencils, yeah. Drop it down. I... I can see on on screen. We can see a lot of. Uh, what, our, what do you? See? Sorry, on on our screen, we are seeing there is some image. Uh, I don't know whether you are keeping it in the slides or this pencil image. Oh, I really don't know. Uh, so let me let me then um, uh, escape and come back and see. Yeah, because uh, we, we are seeing uh, all these pencils uh, on the right side, so it is uh, hindering our screen. Oh, wow. I really don't know. My screen is very clean here. Um, uh, no, we, we can see. I hope other participants can, can stop sharing. Um, yeah, you can, you can reshare. Okay. Is that okay now? Uh, 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 do you see anything? Do you see my, my mm, face? Yes, I can see your face, but uh, just share your screen again. Maybe it disappear. Okay, so maybe maybe I can share the screen. Okay, now is that better now? Uh, still, they are there. Uh, can anyone tell that they are also seeing this, or uh, only me? Yeah, we yes, can we can see, see the pencils. pencils. Yes, yes. see yes. that yes. pencil. a, a oh, set of pen pencils. Oh, oh. Okay, this set of pencils yeah. here? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah yes. it's gone no. now. Thank you so now much. they're gone. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Sorry for interruption. You can continue. Okay, no, no problem. No problem. No, thank you very much for letting me know because I didn't know about my pencils there. <laughs> okay, um, so where were we? So we're good to go now back to uh, our... That's okay. Sorry for interruption. But now uh -huh. it disappeared, right? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so we were talking about Shashruta and, and he, uh, his book is called uh, Shashruta Samahita. Um, I will recommend you to just read this. This is an outstanding author. And he was also a very good teacher. He was teaching youngsters and um, in his book, I wrote, I read something very interesting. He said that no student should touch a patient before they practice surgical skills on fruits and vegetables. So that's low fidelity simulation for you. 600 years before Christian in India. So to, to, it was enlightening for me that, that the idea of simulation, the thought of simulation by teachers is not a new thing. It has always been there. Now, uh, 
the next thing we're going to talk is um, teaching methods in medical education. So we all know that there are three main um, teaching methods in medicine. It's called um, maybe chalk and talk. It's lectures and seminars and reading books and giving assignments and so on. And also see one, do one, teach one. My friend always called this see one, do one, kill one. So uh, that's also called apprenticeship model, which is used in medical education very much. If you uh, look at the research, behind uh, this different methods of um, uh, education, actually knowledge retention after three months for a lecture is only 5%. If you're reading a book, it's 10%. If you add audiovisuals, 20%. Demonstration is 30%. But practice by doing is 75%. And teaching others is 80%. So the apprenticeship model of see one, do one, teach one is perhaps the best model of uh, in medical education. So, uh, but this uh, see one, do one, teach one is based on constructivism theory of Piaget. A Swiss pedagogue Piaget actually uh, said once that uh, learning is secondary to and dependent upon progressive reorganization of cognitive function. To teach, Piaget said, is not to reshape behavior, but to provide the environment for a student to self-explore. So that's a very important thing. Now, based on this constructivism theory, another uh, Russian pedagogue, um, uh, Vygotsky, came up, up with a different idea, saying that uh, learning is a social environment. You learn in a social environment. You can have a computer or a, or, or, a, or a toy and sit in the corner of a room and learn something. So you have, we're learning from each other. So he come up with the theory of social constructivism. We know that with an internet now, nowadays um, computers are the biggest um, social creatures ever invented. So uh, coming to that, uh, let's think now about how do we make clinical decisions? So research has shown that there's four, four types of thinking. It's reduced thinking, dispersed thinking, elaborated thinking, and compiled thinking. So reduced thinking is, is, is equals to empty mind. It's when the student know nothing and can say nothing. So those are very bad students. We don't want to talk about them. Dispersed thinking is, is clustered mind. When you read some books, we know some signs and symptoms, but we cannot really put it together for a patient to make a clinical decision. So that's not also the way we would like to uh, learn things. But elaborated thinking that's based on a deductive reasoning, that is the one that we teach our students how to do clinical reasoning. So we, we, we ask them to, to, to take history, to um, do physical examination, um, and then based on that, do a specific lab tests um, and, and come up with a, with a clinical decision. So the clinical decision making is based on elaborating think, elaborated thinking. But this is mostly done for freshmen, for students who just started medicine. When people finishes medical school and take their degree and go and they work for five years or more, then they switch from elaborated thinking to compiled thinking because compiled thinking is based on recall recognition memory. So when you see a pa uh, uh, like a patient with, with the, uh, influenza or a patient with pneumonia, um, so hundreds of those patients coming through the door for you, when they come, you, you ask five, 10 questions. Within 15 minutes, you make your decisions. You give some prescriptions to go home. While a student to come to that conclusion, it takes maybe a day for them or maybe a, 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 several hours to, to do that. And it's not, we're not doing, a lot of people think, oh, doctors are not paying attention to when they're, they're after money, but it's not. If they are working, they're functioning on the basis of compiled thinking. 
If they have seen um, hundreds of patients with those signs and symptoms, based on that, they can make a decision. So the compiled thinking is, um, I'll recall recognition memories based on Hofding's uh, theory of um, transfer of learning. So uh, there is a slight difference between transfer of learning and transfer of knowledge. Transfer of knowledge is from one person to another person. For example, I'm talking to you now, I learn from you, you learn from me, we learn from each other, we exchange knowledge. But transfer of learning is from the same person to the same person. How our prior experience affects our new encounters or new experiences. So it, 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 and this is um, a very important point uh, for transfer. Transfer of learning is for compiled thinking. So uh, the, there are different type of transfer of learning. I don't wanna go into the details of that, but the most important one for us is cognitive theory of transfer. There is identical theory of transfer. There are other theories. I don't wanna waste your time on that, but what the cognitive theory of transfer is saying is that not what when when we have some um, uh, stimuli and we get um, sensory reception and then sensory perception and then we it goes to our short term memory and then goes to our a long term memory and in the brain we form a semantic network that consists of uh, neurons, nodes, and pathways together to actually represent that experience. And when the next experience occurs, um, we, we go through the same path again, and this time we're not looking to form a, a new semantic network, but we are looking for an existing semantic network to build on the top of it. So, so that's how the cognitive transfer of learning is coming. So uh, actually uh, Chen uh, described the cognitive stages of transfer in 1993. So what he was saying is that usually there's four stages for transfer of learning. There is um, uh, orientation, coaching, tuning, and routinization. So, uh, for if to give you an example, uh, I'm a surgeon, so I will give you a surgical example. If I, when I come to, to teach my students not tying technique, uh, somebody, their mothers already sh uh, taught them how to do, uh, how to, to tie their shoes, right? Shoelaces. So they have something in their back of their brain about not tying. But I have to change now. And, and teach them the new way of not tying so it's more efficient and better and in, can use for surgery. So now, based on what you can see red here, neurons, neuron, uh, semantic ne neural network that they have, in the orientation or introduction, they, they form some new semantic uh, uh, networks. And then, when I start coaching them and they practice and practice under my observation, some of those solidifies and some new neuron networks would, 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 would develop. And then um, they learn how to do that, but now they have to do a lot of practicing for knot tying to actually um, uh, tune their knot tying techniques in one hand, the two handed, uh, square knot or, or simple knot or, or a, a fraction knot or whatever other knots are there. And then after a lot and lots of practice, then they, 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 the, the, the skills of knot tying technique become solidified for them. Now, today we do all these four stages on patients inside the clinic and inside the hospital. And what will happen is, is then this learning competencies in medical education now is becoming expensive, it's time consuming, and it jeopardizes the safety of the patient because we, they, they will go through all these three stages on a patient. That's why in the OR we are so nervous and screaming on, on students, don't do that, don't touch that. You're not, as, 
too loose, you know, you can't do this. So those kind of things. Now, what the environment has changed with simulation is that if we can, according to this chance theory uh, of transfer, if we can have the first three stages in a simulation center, we, we show them how to do knot tying, we coach them to, to uh, perfect it, and we tune them up, and they're ready now to go to clinic. So when they go to clinics, they are in the stage of four, which would, uh, this would make the, the medical education much safer. So uh, now let's see how we can apply this to the efficiency uh, of our medical education. So for efficiency in medical education, we are not, I'm not personally proposing to change the C1, do and teach one. It's a very good method, right? But what will happen in C1, do and teach one and that we start the competency to teach competencies for the students and it'll take maybe three years for us as professors to think, mm -hmm, now this student is ready to go uh, independent. So only in the fourth and fifth year of residency training program, we give students independent work because we don't want to jeopardize um, uh, uh, the, the, the patient safety. However, in the, uh, if we change this method into a more modern method of C1 simulate 101, uh, uh, by the way, the, 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 the number 100 is just hypothetical. <laughs> you can do as much as you want. So, so C1 simulate 100 and then uh, do one and then teach one. That would bring solidification to the knowledge, experience, and competencies of students. And the, as a result, what would happen is that medical, we would make medical education safer, very cost-effective, efficient, and reliable. Reli why I'm saying reliable is because how many times I, I have to teach a heart transplant to my students and there is no transplant patient in my ward. So I have to sit down and talk to them about it. <coughs> But with simulation, I can actually bring them uh, at any time I want. So uh, there are two major problems from my point of view in medical education that we have to work on. One is the discrepancy between theory and practice of medicine. We know how to deliver theory very well. We have done it for thousands of years. But how to transfer the theory to medical practice creates enormous amount of problems for us. And, and actually, we can bridge that, this gap with simulation. So- May uh, I ask, I think there's some uh, some uh, oh, oh. I, I saw your message, so- Sorry, let me see who is talking. Some, I mean, uh, a lot of things Dr. Badi, can you please mute? I mean, some, my father, Somebody's, uh, I mean, he's okay, yeah, but yeah, he sorry, had a uh, kind of we are trying to reversing of it. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry for this interruption. Yes, you can That's continue. It. That's it. The second major gap from my point of view in medical education is that we are all trained individually and credentialed individually as nurses, as doctors, as allied health professionals, social workers, and so on and so forth. But when we uh, go to uh, the, uh, the, the clinical environment, it's expected from us to work as a team. So there is a huge gap between um, theory and practice of medicine. Uh, so, sorry, uh, between uh, 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 individual training and um, uh, team performance in a clinical environment. So this gap, we can also uh, uh, <coughs> bridge with simulation. So what simulation can, can do actually, to it can bridge between theory and practice of medicine. It can build a bridge between uh, individual 
credentialing and learning and a, a team performance in the clinical environment. So um, how to do that? So we, we don't have actually um, one specific method of simulation to, to do that. What we have to do is the component of this bridge should be from different part type of simulation. We, we can do a deep pass simulation. I, you know, deep pass, I, I don't know, you, you communication simulation. Team-centered simulation. We can do patient-centered simulation. We can do scale-centered simulation. So the, the, the building blocks for this bridge that we are doing between theory and practice, between um, individual training and team performance can be, can, can, can consist from different type of simulation. One other thing that I would like you to pay attention when you're thinking about the um, uh, uh, medical programs and medical education is the efficiency versus innovation, right? We, right now, all the programs are built toward efficiency. We exam people, exam people, exam people all the time. We don't allow them to, to, to give their opinion. We don't allow them to, to become themselves as, um, even in the OR as a surgeon, I don't touch that, don't do that. Who taught you to do that? Do it the way I do it. So, so we, we are very strict and, and we, are, we, we work more on efficiency than innovation. And research has shown that if the adaptation corridor between efficiency and innovation is skewed toward efficiency, we do not train independent people. They go out there and, and, and they cannot, they do not, they will not know how to act and how to manage themselves. It's not only in medical education, even in a, even K to 12 education is the same thing. We get, examine them, examine them, examine them, and then they go to, to the, on the streets and, and, and they, they lose themselves. So it is very important from my point of view to to have a balance of innovation and efficiency when we are doing, uh, uh, when making programs for uh, uh, medical education. Um, you perhaps know the very famous classification of simulation. Uh, that's the type of simulation that you can use for your curriculum and for your education. Um, there is life simulation. When a live person is acting on another live person, and that that person is responding back. So um, uh, standardized patients uh, are a good example of life simulation. There is a virtual simulation when you have a, an, an avatar in a virtual environment and you act on avatar and avatar is acting back to you. And this constructive simulation, when you are uh, acting on a machine or an avatar, but avatar makes their own mind, has their own intelligence to respond to you back in relation to what you said. So a different type part of the machine will come back to you from a different, with a different response. So that, uh, that's a bit complicated machines. Um, like um, you, you have perhaps the, um, uh, you know, uh, very good mannequins we have nowadays that, that, that can go into the class of um, uh, constructive simulation and, and also cyber patient as a, uh, as an online uh, simulation can go to the class of constructive simulation. And then there's hybrid simulation. Hybrid simulation is when you use uh, the tissue and the equipment um, and the computer and mix it all together um, to have, have the best of all environments. So now uh, we have talked all about uh, these things and the only um, issue remains for us is cyber patient and its role in medical education. So um, cyber patient is an interactive learning platform that closes the gap between the theory and practice of medicine as we discussed before. Um, and medical students can now practice on a virtual patients before even treating a real patient. The, the major difference between cyber patients and other softwares out there is that other softwares are text-based um, and, and mostly they have some pictures some kind of simple animation, 
but it is a cyber patient is a complete avatar that can actually act like a patient as much as technology allows. So, and also it has a, a, a tutoring, intelligent tutoring system in the background so that when you, uh, when the student goes through in the end, it will give a feedback to the students um, you know, for mistakes he made and uh, for the right choices um, based on gold standards of medical, uh, medical practice. So in, in fact, um, uh, cyber patient is, is um, to, to simplify it, it's a virtual hospital. Uh, it says here 125, but now we have 135 patients. Uh, they're digitally enhanced patients and they're available uh, for students 24 uh, seven. So uh, as I uh, mentioned to you before about the patient availability, now cyber patient is available 24 seven anytime you want and any pathology you want to give to your students. And also you're gonna be in control of your students. You're gonna be communication to your students. You're gonna be a help to your students constantly online. So you can do formative feedback and summative feedback through cyber patient constantly. Formative feedback is perhaps one of the most important um, methods of assessment in medical education because you give feedback. You, you do formative assessment it, during semester. So you're not doing it in the end of the semester, during semester, so you can go back to the students and point out what are the, the, the negative um, uh, uh, scores he has, uh, what are the defaults he has, what are the problems he has, then so how we can uh, eliminate those problems. You can help the students to become a better doctor. That's why I love uh, formative um, assessment. But unfortunately, we cannot do formative assessment more than once during uh, a rotation is because it's time consuming uh, for physicians, for, for, for professors, um, uh, and, and it's also draining. Um, but with, uh, with cyber patient, um, professors can be in control of money students, um, uh, watch what they are doing um, and gave them feedback after coming home after dinner, just for one hour every day, they can give him constant feedback as much as they want. So, um, in, in also students can practice in, in a hospital as uh, Dr. Um, uh, Iqbal said, uh, without any legal or ethical consequences. Also, uh, we have to understand that res our research has shown that it's 10% the cost of standardized patient, at least in, at the University of British Columbia where we are. So uh, cyber patient, in our opinion, would reduce cost of healthcare also by reducing medical errors and um, uh, track and manage cost of care. Um, cyber patient has uh, four different levels. So level one is for uh, clinical year one where people are learning only history taking. And the level two is clinical year two where you learn um, uh, history taking and physical examination and making diagnosis. Cl level three is clinical um, year three, which is mostly rotations and in, in specific courses, clinical uh, for clinical courses for clinical rotations. Or um, level four is mostly for internship, uh, where you uh, can uh, you, you, you try to become a doctor now, now you're in the last stages to become a doctor. So the level three and level four actually is the same. Um, but the difference is that in level three, you can make three mistakes and that system would allow you, the platform would allow you to go forward. Doesn't punish you. But in the end, it would, it would reduce your, your scores and would tell you where your problems are. But level four, actually you, you have to not make mistakes. After you're making three mistakes, you're gonna be kicked out. So as a punishment, so that you, uh, you, you're, you're preparing yourself for your life. Uh, cyber patient can be integrated into any curriculum. It's a tool. It's not an independent um, method of teaching. It's a tool, it's, it's a simulation platform. Um, so you can, uh, use cyber patient as a content for CBL, PBL, group discussions, pre-crawlship, clinical skills, 
or clerkship rotations or internship, as I mentioned before. You can also use uh, uh, in, in your curriculum as an assessment tool. Cyber patient can use it for, for, as a prerequisite um, to an exam. You can tell, you know, you have to reach 50%, um, 60%, 70% uh, cyber patient before you're going to be allowed to go to the, this clinical rotation exam. Or um, it's good for formative assessment, as we discussed before. I love that part of it. And also provide you a summative assessment tool and also can be used for OSCEs. Um, a few words about uh, the research that we have done so far with cyber patient. Um, cyber patient is actually used um, uh, in 125 countries and 300 universities around the world. And, um, um, uh, and but, but there are a few uh, universities that we have research contract with and they're doing independent research. So the first um, research we uh, have done is um, was done actually uh, long before uh, with cyber patient 1.0 in in um, uh, in what it, it was done in two universities in Japan in Kochi University in Jichi University. So what um, that uh, actually what we did is that we had two group of uh, uh, three group of students actually uh, one oh, the, the subjects we went through um, uh, textbook and the other one went through cyber patient and the other one was sham. They did not go through anything. So uh, all the students were done a multiple choice exam before and after and also an ASCII before and after. So the research has shown that actually um, uh, pe people who use cyber patient uh, group, the cyber patient group uh, was significantly uh, better in OSCE examination and also in multiple choice questions than the textbook uh, group. And also when we plotted the um, end of the year uh, performance of these students um, in, in a regression analysis, we found that students who were lower achiever, they exceed achievement with cyber patient and students the 10 percent of students who were higher achievers at the university it didn't make any difference for them so the um, the other uh, uh, study that we did with uh, history taking at the University of British Columbia also shows that um, uh, within history taking it would make um, a, a huge difference and also um, there we showed that this is 10% um, of the standardized patient when it, when it relish, in relation to the cost. In, in Kazan State Medical University in Russia, they use this um, cyber patient um, for, for the whole semester and, and they did a, a, a survey afterward and they found that 90% of uh, participants reported as high impact in clinical decision making for them. Um, and they love uh, to use cyber patient for their uh, studying. Recently, it's not in here, but I just got the data yesterday. Um, um, the, in, in Kazan State Medical University, they did a, ver a very nice experiment. Uh, because of the COVID-19, many of their foreign students could not come back to Russia for studying. So they, it, it naturally made two groups one group that were staying in Russia and one group was outside Russia. And so the group outside Russia used cyber patient and the group inside Russia used traditional methods. And now they, they did the comparative analysis and, and guess what? Uh, same thing, uh, it moved a lot of lower achievers, cyber patient moved a lot of lower achievers to higher achievers. And, in, and the, the number of higher achievers in, in cyber patient group that were way away from, from the university uh, was significantly higher than, um, than higher achievers in, uh, in, in the traditional group. So in, in summary, I can, I can tell you that um, uh, cyber patient is the only disruptive technology in our opinion that will revolutionize medical education and will provide benefit to everyone. It will benefit students, it will benefit the faculty, 
and will benefit the educational institution by reducing the cost. It will support the healthcare system by reducing the cost. It also can be used by regulatory bodies. So um, uh, now we are actually building a cyber patient for maintenance of competency. We um, uh, uh, got in partnership with the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. And also we just uh, received, uh, I cannot announce this officially because you haven't got the letter, but, but, uh, but, but I can share this idea uh, is that uh, it was chosen amongst many other projects uh, by Canadian Space Agency and uh, National Research Council of Canada as a platform to be used uh, for maintenance of competency in deep space. So nowadays, you know that um, everybody likes to go to Mars and, and behind Mars, and those travels would take more than five years, five, 10 years, 20 years. So uh, the medical crew, uh, the medical team that is in the cruise ship, uh, they are, uh, uh, the, the crew is usually very healthy people. And so the medical team that goes with the crew and the ship for five years, uh, they may not be able to practice medicine, so they will lose their clinical skills. So now we have been chosen to provide an environment for those um, uh, the, 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 the medical team and the crew to maintain their competencies. So it's, it's a long shot, but, we've, uh, but we are working toward that. We also have many other products in the, in the pipeline. We have uh, the, uh, a, a product for EPA, uh, Entrustable Professional Activities. Nobody in the world has, it's a patented for us. Uh, we have a team training um, uh, uh, where you can do a, a, a team training, that the second gap I was talking about uh, to support. Um, and also um, we have the, the communication um, uh, uh, platform <coughs> for delivering the bad news, for talking to the family of the patient, the patient or uh, social workers and other people. Um, so all these, I don't wanna waste your time, but all these things are in the pipeline, it, it's, it's coming. But at this time, um, I just wanted to um, summarize what we talked about. I hope it was not boring for you. Um, uh, I, I think we reached our learning objectives. Um, we talked about the touch base on simulation history. Um, on, on teaching methods in, in medical education. It's very superficial, actually. Every one of these would need a full lecture to, to, to do. And how do we make clinical decisions, how to develop an effective simulation program and um, cyber patient as a tool for medical education. I would like to thank you very much. This was this morning in Vancouver. It doesn't happen very often. If you have any questions, That's I will move. That's so wonderful. That's so wonderful, Prof. Uh, Karim. It was uh, really an amazing presentation uh, because we had uh, insight into quite modern technology tools, uh, cyber patient. And that really amazed me that how it will be used in future. People are going to Mars and then five years they will be using it, which is really, really a mind-blowing idea. Uh, well, uh, we have a question. Yes, Prof Khalid. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Prof Kayumi, for your uh, informative and wonderful talk. Uh, it's really glad to hear from you directly about the cyber patients, as I uh, wonder uh, to know more about it. Uh, uh, I have a comment and, and probably a question for you. My comment, I remember uh, early in uh, uh, 2004, uh, I was invited uh, uh, by uh, the organizer of the first grand round, monthly grand round at King Fahad Medical City. Uh, at that time, they want to start a monthly grand round. And uh, they told me, could you uh, give us um, uh, the first grand round about something in medical education, anything in medical education? And I thought probably I talk about simulation. And I remember the title of my talk about patient simulation in medical education. And uh, 
uh, I uh, brought some comparison slides between aviation and uh, medical practice. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I raised a question uh, for the medical professionals at that time. Why aviation, uh, they are very strict in, in, in the safety of the passengers in air. And they used simulation heavily and they make it as a mandatory uh, uh, practice before uh, they trust any uh, uh, pilot uh, to take care of, uh, of the passengers. But um, as compared to medical practice, we talk about patient safety a lot and we spend a lot of uh, time in our practice to make sure uh, about the safety of our patients. But we still, we, 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 we don't tr trust uh, more uh, our, our fresh graduates uh, when it comes to the safety. Uh, and I also uh, concluded that I'm sure uh, in near uh, future, we're gonna see a patient simulation centers uh, in each hospital, in each uh, uh, clinical practice, because we still, we need more uh, emphasis on the use of simulation to make sure that our um, uh, young physicians and surgeons uh, to practice more in simulation before they touch uh, the patients. Now, uh, I, I, I just want to ask you about um, uh, the uh, cyber patients and uh, maybe I emphasize about the literature because I, when I come across the literature, I've, I found uh, very few uh, papers uh, about cyber patients. And I wonder, although uh, you have, um, I think, published something in 2004 uh, about cyber patients, but still we have a lack of literature about the impact and the efficacy. Uh, is there any um, rationale for that? Uh, please, Prof. Kayum. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, let, let me elaborate a little bit on, on the first thing you said. I, I totally agree with you. Uh, but that, that simulation in medical education is far behind. It's still far behind. And the reason for that is because it's a cultural shift. So, um, you know, it's very difficult. Um, the, the most difficult uh, place to do cultural shift is universities. Business and its own industries, you show profit, they change a the culture. In, in, in medical uh, or any university, any professor thinks that they're, they're the gods, you know, and they're close to the gods or whatever. So they, they, they're walking on the water. So they, they, they don't have to listen to anyone. So, so uh, unfortunately, uh, particularly people who are in the power, um, uh, they, they just don't want to change their habits of doing things and doing new things and learning new tricks. So I totally sympathize with you and understand that. With this relation to your question, uh, yes, there is a rationale behind it, and I'll tell you. Cyber patient was actually, uh, as an idea, developed in uh, year 2000, so 1999, 2000. We developed cyber patient, it was based on my perception of how we can use the technology to, to, bridge, to, to build the bridge between theory and practice of medicine because I as a student had problems with that and as a professor also. So uh, we, at that time, our idea was way ahead of technology. We didn't have a, a good bandwidth. We didn't have a good internet um, uh, languages and we didn't have um, good databases. So um, at that time, just the internet was growing. And so when in year 2000, uh, we spent one and a half million dollars, just made um, uh, 13 uh, cases of acute abdomen. 
And um, it was impossible to commercialize that because we made it in a CD-ROM because internet was not there at that time. So um, we used those CD-ROMs to do some research at the University of British Columbia in Japan, as I show it to you. And it was published in the most prestigious journal um, of, of uh, British Journal of, of uh, Medical Education in 2004. But we use this for academics, but we, uh, we were waiting for the technology to catch up with the ideas. And in 2015, University of British Columbia came back to me and asked me to, to revitalize cyber patient because the technology is there now. And, and then we did um, uh, a year of research and we found out that yes, we can now do everything we want. We could have databases, we could have online uh, accessibilities, we could have, we could have, um, uh, we have now very dynamic languages like JavaScript, like, uh, you know, you, you just name it. HTML5 at that time was not even started. You know? so, um, so we revitalized this, and that's why we called it Cyber Patient 1.0, and then Cell patient 2.0 started in 2016, actually the development of it. And we finished it in 2019, 125 um, uh, patients, digitally enhanced patients in, in, a, in a clinical in, in environment. So the actual research with cyber patient, the new research uh, started um, uh, from 2019 and 2020. So the three, four papers that you're seeing uh, or uh, from that, uh, from 2018, 19, um, and 2020. So uh, by the time a research project goes on and, and they do the validation and then they, they do the experimentation, it will take time. Uh, and, um, but we, we have now research contracts with many prestigious universities, um, such as Kazan State Medical University. We have in Japan, we have a, 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 with Rajishi University in Japan. We have in London, England, we have research partners in, um, uh, in, um, um, uh, in um, uh, Bulgaria. <laughs> uh, we have research partners all over the world, you know, and we, we have research partners in the United States. Actually, Stanford University is talking to us to do some research. So. Uh, to, to answer your question shortly, um, the new cyber patient uh, with the new evidence is starting just on, on um, uh, as a new concept uh, from 2019 on. So that's why, but you will see more and more um, evidences as you. Yeah. As, um, Th as thank, you, thank you, Prof. Kayumi. Uh, it makes sense. And we are very willing here at SISMI uh, to be a part of any projects, uh, research projects, if, if uh, you allow me, because we have an active uh, researchers in medical education, and we can talk uh, about this later. Thank you. Please, please just contact me, or most welcome. Anybody, most welcome. It, it, actually, cyber patient as a disruptive technology opens a huge area of research educational research, huge, you can't believe. In Bulgaria, they are, what they are doing, the person is doing his PhD on knowledge retention after clinical rotation of pediatrics. So, so there's there tons of opportunities to do that. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Uh, yes, Prof Almardi. We can't hear you. Uh, Can you hear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah? Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sergio, and thank you very much, uh, Prof. Yumi, for an informative uh, webinar and talk. Uh, actually, I wanted just to thank you and to tell you that we promised you, me and Shazia, that we will have a talk about avenues of collaboration, but already Prof. Khalid uh, started the discussion and, and he also said, we probably would like to discuss this further later on through uh, another meeting, either uh, the Riyadh office or, or the part, uh, the parent uh, uh, society. So thank you very much again, and uh, we look forward to the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. 
Um, any other question by participants? Uh, if you have any question, please feel free to raise your hand uh, before we finish our talk. Probably I can't see any more questions. So I would say uh, uh, wonderful thanks for this presentation. And uh, uh, it was really amazing. And this is uh, thought provoking now for medical educators to think that how they can apply at their own institutions to enhance simulation uh, based medical education uh, and how to develop culture, how to adopt technology because this, this era is cutting edge technology. So we need to think seriously that how quickly we can adopt it. The more fast we adopt it, the more success we can achieve. So we need to educate our society and we need to uh, do our best to train our uh, doctors and physicians. Yeah, so thank you so much. And thank, thanks to all participants. And I would say goodbye then. Have a good day. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Please contact um, Mark Ritchie or me directly for anything you um, sure. you. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, sure, sure. Sure, sure. Sure, sure. Bye.